Can you come to order? Good afternoon and welcome. I am Congressman Dennis Kucinich, Chairman of the Domestic <laughs> Policy Subcommittee of Government Reform and Oversight. I am joined today by the ranking member of the committee, uh, Mr. Jordan of Ohio. Our hearing today is arbitration or arbitrary the misuse of mandatory arbitration to collect consumer debts. The subject of this hearing, the use of mandatory pre-dispute arbitrations as a method of obtaining judgments for consumer debts, is not what we normally think of when we hear the terms arbitration or consumer arbitrations. We're not talking about arbitrations brought by consumers against businesses, and we're not talking about individual arbitrations brought by businesses against consumers. We're talking about mass production arbitrations where businesses file thousands of claims against consumers to obtain judgments on credit card debt, where the claims are assigned to arbitrators in batches of dozens where the consumer almost never appears or even responds, and where the so-called hearing consists of nothing more than the arbitrator looking at a statement written by the creditor and awarding the amount that the creditor requests. Over the past few months, the Domestic Policy Subcommittee has conducted an investigation into the actual practices of the two largest providers of consumer arbitration services, the National Arbitration Forum, known as the NAF, and the American Arbitration Association, the uh, AAA. NAF is by far the number one generator of arbitration awards against credit card customers. The AAA also administered consumer debt collection arbitrations and state that they have stopped doing this as of uh, June 2009. Subcommittee staff reviewed over 50,000 pages of documents, including hundreds of actual case files, to determine how the claims were decided by the arbitrators. Our investigators have come to several deeply disturbing conclusions about the National Arbitration Forum's arbitration system. Who wins or loses an NAF arbitration seems to depend solely on which arbitrator reviews the claim. As part of our review, subcommittee staff compared 228 nearly identical NAF consumer debt collections claims and we found that three arbitrators granted awards in favor of the debt collection firm 
nearly 100 percent of the time, while two arbi arbitrators reviewing otherwise identical claims dismiss those claims nearly 100 percent of the time. Our review of these files found absolutely no reason in the case files to explain such inconsistent results. We also found that some of NAF's arbitrators either don't know the rules they're supposed to follow or they don't follow them and nobody at NAF seems to care. One NAF rule establishes a limit to the amount of time between filing of the claim and service of notice on the consumer debtor. Our investigation found that NAF does not require its arbitrators to adhere to this rule. Out of a total of 172 consumer debt collection claims that could have been dismissed under those rules, none were. What's more, NAF is also violating a California law by refusing to publish the results of many of its arbitrations with residents of that state. Our investigation further revealed that this violation is allowing at least one debt collection company to obtain awards of attorney's fees that exceed legal limits. The subcommittee staff's findings support a considerable body of evidence showing NAF's misuse of mandatory arbitration in debt collection cases. Last week, the Attorney General of the State of Minnesota filed a lawsuit against the NAF alleging violations of Minnesota's consumer fraud statute and other claims based on NAF's concealment of its ties to creditors, its active solicitation of creditors based on promises of providing leverage over consumers, its direct financial affiliation with one of the country's largest debt collectors. Remarkably, just this past Saturday, the NAF agreed to a settlement with the, Minnesota, uh, with the Minnesota Attorney General in which it would immediately stop all arbitration proceedings that are the subject of this hearing. The settlement does not admit wrongdoing, however. NAF still maintains that its arbitrations and arbitrators are fair and independent. Our investigation strongly suggests otherwise. And we will hear from the NAF, public justice, and from the Attorney Gen General of Minnesota herself, uh, the Honorable Ms. Lori Swanson, on a supposed neutrality of NAF arbitrations. The hearing today will also address other systemic problems the subcommittee investigation found with this arbitration system, such as why the right to appeal a decision in consumer arbit arbitration claims is limited to a finding of fraud or corruption, the lack of oversight of the claims process itself, and the bias built into arbitrations, uh, arbitrations facing, or favoring rather, the debt co collection industry. Now, defenders of this mass production arbitration system argue that abolishing it will only raise the cost of litigating debt collection cases. But consumers have rights and protections under the law that are not honored in the arbitration setting. Furthermore, the number of Americans who have experienced the suspension of their rights due to consumer arbitration has grown as the number of consumers with debt has exploded. Today, the average adult carries over $4,000 of debt. The co debt collection industry and the alternative legal system that's been created around it can no longer be ignored by the federal government. Others seem to agree with us. There are a number of bills in Congress that would impose limits on the applicability of mandatory pre-dispute arbitration agreements, including one introduced by our colleague, Representative Hank Johnson. Very significantly, Congressman Barney Frank, chairman of the Financial Services Committee, has introduced a bill to establish a new consumer protection agency which would have the power to limit or ban mandatory pre-dispute consumer arbitration agreements. And the Federal Trade Commission is currently evaluating the entire system of debt collection, including arbitration practices, with an eye towards the much needed modernization of debt collection laws. 
I hope this hearing will bring increased awareness to the problems of the mandatory consumer debt arbitration system. Hold those accountable that have abused consumers' rights in the past and explore solutions to improve the system so it's no longer a one-stop shop for debt collection agencies to obtain a binding legal judgment against the consumer. Our citizens deserve nothing less. Uh, at, at this time, uh, or pre, uh, prior to recognizing Mr. Jordan, I just want to um, uh, observe the presence of our colleague uh, f from Maryland, uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you for being here. And our colleague from California, uh, Ms. Watson, thank you for being here. And uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Jordan thank his you. opening statement. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the challenges consumers face in troubled economic times only underscore the importance of this hearing. This particular hearing provides an excellent opportunity to discuss and debate mandatory arbitration clauses. This is an important matter, and I look forward to having a productive discussion on the many issues surrounding consumer arbitration. As we debate President Obama's proposed Consumer Financial Protection Agency, we must think hard about the way this new agency would operate. Mr. Obama's existing proposal is the latest of the administration's expanding its reach into the private sector. I'm particularly concerned that under the new agency, the administration would have the authority to eliminate mandatory arbitration clauses. This is simply bad policy. Well-respected academics and experts agree arbitration is fair, equitable, and necessary. In 2007, Professor Peter Rutledge told the Senate Judiciary Committee that in a world without pre-dispute arbitration, consumers would face higher costs. Professor Rutledge explained the only people who with certainty benefit from the Arbitration Fairness Act are the lawyers. Frankly, it's the undisputed fact that this is primarily the trial lawyers that stand to benefit from the elimination of arbitration clauses. During a House Judiciary markup, Representative Hank Johnson claimed mandatory pre-dispute binding arbitration clauses leave consumers without choices. But these choices have nothing to do with consumer rights as much as tactics for lawyers to make money. Representative Johnson stated, quote, you can't influence large corporations by being nice. You need a jury to get into their pocket, close quote. Unfortunately, justice is sometimes the price you pay. 2008, Mississippi lawyer Dickie Scruggs pleaded guilty to conspiring to bribe a judge and is currently serving a seven-year sentence in federal prison. Bill Eric and Mel Weiss are each serving time in jail for a criminal conspiracy of paying millions of dollars in illegal kickbacks to lead plaintiffs in a, case, in a class action lawsuit in order to help the lawyers win the race to the courtroom. Kentucky plaintiffs' lawyers William Gallion and Shirley Cunningham, Jr. were jailed in order to pay uh, disgorgement of the $30 million they scammed from their clients in settlement over the uh, diet drug uh, FinFan. Uh, FinFin, excuse me. The point I'm making is, is just because you have a few bad apples, you don't throw out the whole barrel. If it's true for tr lawyers, it's also true for arbitration. Today's oversight hearing is set to focus on consumer arbitration, not the evils of business. If, for example, credit card companies are harming consumers, then a separate hearing is needed. Statistics citing that consumers overwhelmingly lose in debt collection cases do not support the, no the notion that arbitration is the enemy. By way of example, the federal government wins nearly all of its cases to recover unpaid student loan debt. Is the federal government to blame when debtors lose? Is arbitration? Today's hearing should foster debate on policy directly related to mandatory arbitration. Whether or not arbitration, which provide a dispute resolution service, is good or bad for consumers is an inquiry independent from whether debt collection as a business is bad for consumers. Consumers have successfully used arbitration to resolve disputes with businesses. Debt collection may present serious problems to consumers, but the best evidence available would indicate that those problems are worse in litigation than in arbitration. It is my hope that the members here today can help our witnesses tailor this hearing to the empirical data available concerning debt collection and consumer cases. Only then can we make progress in providing remedies to consumers. A flat-out elimination of mandatory arbitration is not the answer. To that end, I hope discussion, or excuse me, I hope today's discussions also examine feasible alternatives to remedy the issues at hand. I'm also concerned, Mr. Chairman, that three of the four witnesses called today by the majority have benefited from a lawsuit and successful settlement with the majority's fourth witness, the National Arbitration Forum. This may not prohibit us from having a productive hearing, but it is certainly a fact worth noting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing today. The issues not only affect our home state of Ohio, but also the entire United States. And I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. I oh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I would also ask unanimous consent uh, for the minority staff report uh, be included in the, in the record. Without objection. Mr. Chairman, I'd also ask for unanimous consent that a statement received from ACA International and an email be included in the hearing uh, record as well. Uh, I'd ask the gentleman, do we, do we have the email? Yes, we do right here. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and without objection, uh, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. Uh, without objection, uh, at some point we will welcome Representative Hank Johnson uh, to the dais uh, to uh, make a statement if he comes in time or receive testimony and participate in the questions. And without objection, uh, all, uh, all members uh, will have uh, uh, three minutes, uh, opening statements not to exceed three minutes. Uh, I'm also uh, without objection, uh, Mr. Jordan, uh, w without objection, we're also going to put the staff report of the uh, Democratic Policy Subcommittee Majority Staff on arbitration abuse uh, in, in the record. The uh, chair recognizes a gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for a three-minute statement. Mr. Chairman, uh, I thank you for calling this hearing, and I will just submit a written statement. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes uh, Ms. Watson of California for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, <clears throat> for holding today's important hearing to evaluate whether consumer debt collection arbitration as currently administered produces results that are fair to both businesses and consumers. Today, virtually all consumers often unknowingly enter into mandatory arbitration agreements, forging their right uh, to regular court proceedings as part of the fine print of consumer employment and franchise agreements. While some contend arbitration offers consumers a more cost-effective procedure with all the protections of a traditional litigation procedure, the investigation of this committee and the case brought by the Attorney General of the State of Minnesota against the National Arbitrary Arbitration Forum have revealed significant concerns about the neutrality of the arbitration process for consumer debt collection. A uh, June 5th cover story in Business Week, Week magazine entitled Banks Versus Consumers, Guess Who Wins, describes the business practice of the National Arbitration Forum, which dominates credit card arbitration and operates in a system in which it is exceedingly difficult for individuals to prevail. Uh, I'd like to enter this particular uh, report to the record. Without objection. Internal documents discussed in the article describe NAF's marketing uh, pitches to credit card companies where they depict their arbitration services as favorable to businesses with the promise. Uh, marked increase in recovery rates over existing collection methods. Rather than providing the neutral uh, resolution service they portray to the public, in these confidential documents, the NAF describes the benefits of pro-business hasty arbitration with little to no mention of the rights or concerns of the consumer. Elizabeth Bartolet, a Harvard Law School professor and former arbitrator for NAF, is quoted describing their practices as a process that systematically serves the interests of credit card companies. Um, so today's hearing comes at a very critical point. With unemployment at 9.5% nationally and 11.4% in my district in Los Angeles, California, and $928 billion worth of outstanding credit card debt in the United States as of May 2009, it is imperative we gain meaningful insight into how we can improve this process and empower American consumers with the ability to fairly manage their consumer obligations. So, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to today's testimony, and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. The uh, chair recognizes Mr. Foster. You may proceed for three minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, today's hearing follows months of extensive investigation by this subcommittee into hundreds of cases of consumer debt collection arbitration. But it is timely, coming less than one week after the National Arbitration Forum agreed to stop accepting all future consumer arbitrations. The settlement in Minnesota is instructive, but it's not the end of the story. The authority for commercial arbitration originated in the Federal Arbitration Act, a 1925 law that may well be out of date and in need of significant improvement. It is this panel's duty to uncover and work to correct flaws in arbitration proceedings. I look forward to hearing from all our witnesses on pragmatic solutions that will ensure consumers as well as businesses are dealt with fairly. And it's my hope that this committee will work swiftly to implement them. It may also be useful to view today's hearing in the context of wider financial reform. The patterns of collusion that we will hear about today seem not unlike the conflicts of interest that have emerged, for example, between credit rating agencies and the issuers of, of instruments that they rate. The challenge of this Congress will be to devise fair and workable reforms to our financial system that ensure that neutral parties are in fact neutral and to ensure that consumers as well as businesses are protected. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, if there are no uh, additional opening statements, the subcommittee will receive testimony from the witnesses before us today. I want to start by introducing our panel. Ms. Lori Swanson, welcome. Uh, is the Attorney General of the State of Minnesota. Ms. Swanson was elected Attorney General of the State of Minnesota in 2006 and previously served as Solicitor General and Deputy Attorney General from 1999 to 2006. Attorney General Swanson's legal actions, legislative efforts, and consumer advocacy have helped to level the playing field on behalf of ordinary citizens. She drafted and helped secure the enactment of a predatory mortgage lending law in 2007 that has been nationally heralded as a model for other states. She has sued cell phone companies, many of which use mandatory arbitration clauses for extending people's contracts without their permission, then charging hefty early cancellation penalties when they tried to cancel. She's also sued collection agencies for trying to trick citizens into paying debts they do not owe. On July 14, 2009, Attorney General Swanson filed a lawsuit against the National Arbitration Forum, alleging that it misrepresented its independence and hid from consumers and the public its extensive ties to the collection industry. On July the 17th, she entered into a landmark settlement with the National Arbitration Forum she has publicly expressed concern about the growing use of mandatory arbitration clauses in credit card, cell phone, and mortgage contracts. Mr. Michael Kelly, welcome. Mr. Kelly was until recently the uh, chief operating officer of the National Arbitration Forum, where he oversaw all operational legal matters. He is now Chief Executive Officer of Forthright, an entity spun off from the NAF in late 2007, which handles all administrative matters for the National Arbitration Forum. Previously, he held executive positions with the Minnesota Vikings and Gander Mountain and was a partner at the Minneapolis law firm Fagri and Benson. Mr. Kelly served for eight years on the Adena, Minnesota City Council and was the Mayor Pro Tem and Vice Chair of the Housing and Redevelopment Authority. He has served on the board of the Minneapolis Downtown Council and the board of the Minnesota Opera. Ms. Uh, Dr. or rather Mr. Richard W. Namark. Welcome, Mr. Namark. He is the Senior Vice President in the International uh, for the International Center for Dispute Resolution, a division of the American Arbitration Association, where he has overall responsibility for international issues and government relations. He's the founder and former executive director of the Global Center for Dispute Resolution Research. Mr. Namark is an experienced mediator and facilitator, having served as a neutral in a wide variety of business and organizational settings. His experience includes work with the United Nations, government, universities, corporate, construction, insurance, and nonprofit areas. Mr. 
F. Paul Bland. Mr. Bland, welcome. Has been a, uh, Mr. Bland has been a staff attorney at Public Justice since 1997 and is responsible for developing, handling, and helping public justices, cooperating attorneys litigate a diverse docket of public interest cases. He has argued in one more than 20 cases that have led to re reported decisions for consumers, employees, or whistleblowers in four of the U.S. Courts of Appeals and the High Courts of six different states. He is currently hand, uh, handling or assisting with appeals before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, the California, Florida, Kentucky, and Nevada Supreme Courts, and the Maryland Court of Appeals. Uh, finally, Professor Christopher R. Trajoso. Welcome, uh, Professor. Professor uh, Zedre or Trajoso? Trajoso is the John M. Rounds Professor of Law University of Kansas uh, School of Law. He is chair of the Arbitration Task Force at the Searle Civil Justice Institute at Northwestern University School of Law. The professor has written extensively on the law and economics of arbitration. He's authored a case book on commercial arbitration and co-edited a book on empirical research on international commercial arbitration. Prior to teaching, Professor Drahozo was in private law practice in Washington, D.C., and served as a law clerk for the Iran U.S. Claims Tribunal and the United States Supreme Court and the United States Courts of Appeal for the Fifth Circuit. I want to thank uh, each and every one of our witnesses for appearing before our subcommittee today. It is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask uh, at this time if you would rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Let the record reflect that uh, each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I ask that each of the witnesses uh, now give a brief summary of their testimony. And to keep this summary under five minutes in duration, uh, bear in mind that your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. So don't feel that you have to do a 10-minute speech in five minutes. I tried that once as a witness many years ago, and it was not fun. Uh, but we'll get all of your statement in the record. Let's start the discussion right now. Uh, Attorney General Swanson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Kucinich, uh, Ranking Member uh, Jordan, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear here before you on this very important topic of mandatory arbitrations. You know, the right to have disputes resolved impartially is something that we as Americans value very much. Yet uh, millions of Americans are giving away that right without even knowing it. Credit card companies, cell phone companies, lenders routinely bury in the fine print of contracts that may run upwards of 25 or 30 pages long these mandatory pre-dispute arbitration clauses. And consumers don't know it. And oftentimes the clauses come to the consumer not even in an initial agreement, but after the fact, maybe in an envelope stuffer. And even if the consumer doesn't see it, largely they're deemed to be bound to it. We filed a uh, lawsuit against the National Arbitration Forum in uh, Minnesota. We attached a copy of the complaint to the testimony submitted, so I won't go through all of it. But the bottom line is that the National Arbitration Forum represented to the public, to consumers, to the courts, to the government, that it was independent and neutral and operated impartially and like a court system, when in fact, it had ties to the very industry that brought claims before it. And those ties really came two ways. First way the ties came was what I would call backroom hustling, going to the credit card companies and the banks and so on and so forth, and asking the lenders to put into the fine print of these contracts mandatory arbitration clauses, and playing executives' commissions when they put clauses into those contracts and then having other executives who were paid commissions to convince those very corporations to file claims against the consumer in the interest of the creditors against the interest of the consumer. 
In addition, uh, far from the impartiality represented to the consumers, marketing materials given to the credit card companies uh, said things like, the customer doesn't know what to expect from arbitration and they're more willing to pay. Or in arbitration, they basically ask you what it is and then hand you the money. In addition to that, we found evidence that the company in some cases drafted claims, the equivalent of a summons and complaint in a court of law on behalf of the creditor uh, to be filed against the consumer. That in some cases, creditors were advised what their legal rights were when consumers weren't. In fact, we heard from uh, employees who said that when consumers did call, people were instructed to really try to get them off the phone as quickly as possible, and even in some cases, not to pass on a consumer's answer or information to the arbitrator. We also heard from arbitrators who felt that they were deselected, so that they had been appointed by the company to handle claims, but when they didn't rule for the creditor or give the creditor everything it wanted, or if they terminated or, or didn't, in some cases, ruled for the consumer, that they were deselected or taken off the panel. And then, in addition to that, we found that the National Arbitration Forum is really part of one big debt collection conglomerate, that you have a New York hedge fund uh, called Accretive that essentially owned a $42 million stake in the National Arbitration Forum outfit, and at the same time that it owned a debt collection law firm called Axiant, which in turn owned and acquired the debt collection operations of a law firm called Man Bracken, which is just about the biggest debt collection law firm in the country. So basically, having this hedge fund controlling the two sides of the equation, or, or involved in the two sides of the equation, the debt collection side, and then as well the arbitration side. Something that we did learn in connection with the investigation that I find troubling and gets a bit far afield is that the Small Business Administration in 2004 gave Accretive $100 million, and in 2008, the Accretive Small Business Investment Corporation uh, ended up purchasing about 7.5% of Axiant. And then in 2009, uh, it uh, asked the Small Business Administration for permission to purchase even more of Axiant. So essentially, it appears using small business administration money to fund a debt collection enterprise that then treats consumers in an unfair fashion. It's troubling to me if the small business administration believes that its mission is to finance the acquisition of debt collectors who acquire bank debt from bailed out national banks and then use the funds to go after citizens through the types of questionable debt collection techniques we outlined in the complaint. Um, we asked the Small Business Administration for records they produced after consulting with the hedge fund 18 pages, largely blacked out. I couldn't get to the bottom of it. Maybe this committee on oversight can, and I would encourage you to follow up on, is SBA money going into this type of enterprise? They basically blacked out almost, almost every meaningful word. Duly noted. The, uh, um, the, general, the gentlelady's time uh, is I'm expired. Is okay. expired. Thank you. Uh, would you like to just wrap it up? Just to wrap up, we interviewed over 100 consumers. Uh, the case um, and our concerns go beyond the National Arbitration Forum. There are real concerns with mandatory pre-dispute arbitration clauses and consumers forfeiting their rights without knowing it and the repeat bias uh, that comes in when corporations essentially select their judge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Kelly. You may proceed for five minutes. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Member Jordan, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I, I want to reiterate we have withdrawn the National Arbitration Forum from handling consumer arbitrations pursuant to an agreement with the Attorney General. That being said, it's our continued belief that the forum's exit from this business and the loss of consumer arbitration broadly would represent a significant loss to the consumers that you're seeking to protect. The logical conclusion of this decision is that the consumer cases will all now be brought in court. Initially, I'd like to explore the consequences of that prospect. For those who haven't been to small claims in conciliation court, which I have, it is not often a pleasant experience. In that case, the notice, the response procedures can be very complicated. There's often no representation. Days off of work are required. You sit in a cattle call with hundreds of other people waiting for your opportunity to be heard, and your public finances and issues are revealed for all to see who are there in court. It's not particularly a pleasant experience. It's one that was outlined and, and discussed significantly in a Boston Globe article in 2006, which I think is pertinent here. In that article, the Boston Globe found in Massachusetts that the courts were stacked against the average consumer. 
If I can read from the article, it says that many small claims courts have effectively become accomplices of collection firms, routinely giving them the upper hand in court cases while casually disregarding the rights and dignity of ordinary citizens. Collectors almost always win the lawsuits they file without being asked for evidence that the debts they, they are chasing are actually owed. Debtors frequently receive no notice of the lawsuits against them. The disabled, elderly, and working poor are often talked into repaying debts from government checks, which are by law protected from judgment. I quote here, the creditors are all repeat players. They know exactly how the game works, said Elizabeth Warren, a Harvard Law School professor who studies consumer debt. We're watching a fight between two players, one a skilled repeat gladiator, and one who's thrown into the ring for the first time and gets clubbed over the head before they even get a sense of what the rules are. That's the court we're talking about. These cases don't go in front of juries. They go in front of small claim and conciliation courts. Now, what is the difference with arbitration? I can only speak to the difference of arbitration before the forum as it was conducted. And these are some of the fundamental differences. Under the forum rules, responses can be in simple, plain English in whatever form the consumer chooses. Hearings are flexible on their own time of the consumers. They can be handled on the paper, by telephone, or by participatory hearing in the federal jurisdiction in which they live. They're affordable. There's no cost to respond, and to file, the cost is only $19 to $40 on average. They're fair. The cases are decided on the merits by retired judges and lawyers with approximately 15 years of experience. And on the merits is a critical distinction between the courts that we need to make. Cases in front of the forum, as they were conducted, require the judge, regardless of whether the consumer is present, to look at the merits and decide the case on a matter of law. That is not the same as a default judgment in court. Decisions in arbitration are also confirmed by court, by the court before they are binding, which again is a court of last instance. The purpose of the comparison is to point out that there are very real and meaningful consequences to the elimination of consumer arbitration. We're no longer part of that fight. But I think it's important to note these consequences and the impact of reversing or changing over 80 years of law under the Federal Arbitration Act would have. I would urge that the discussion should center around two very basic questions. First, why? And second, what are the two true due process issues? I say why because from the results we've seen, from the studies we've seen, if the same subject matter is shown, and there are obviously people who can speak to this better than I, the results in court are the same as the results in arbitration. Due process is truly the heart of the matter. It needs to be studied. Due process protection should be made. The, the ground needs to be leveled for everyone who will practice in this field. But if that is evaluated by this committee and this Congress, we're confident that consumer arbitration will not be eliminated and should not be eliminated. Choice should be provided to select arbitration or court, and due process measures should be allowed and made uniform so that everyone has equal access to affordable justice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank the uh, gentleman for his testimony. The chair recognizes Mr. Neymark. You may proceed. Thank you, Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Member Jordan, other members of Congress and the committee. First, I must stress, and I'm sure you'll understand, the American Arbitration Association is a not-for-profit service organization founded in 1926. We've been around for over 83 years. The AAA does not represent or speak for any other organization, but rather we speak only from our own experience over these 83 years. From the beginning, the AAA has drafted rules and procedures for fair and balanced dispute resolution. Our many sets of rules and procedures have been scrutinized by the courts at all levels. As early as 1951, we established with the American Bar Association Code, a series of codes of ethics for arbitrators which are still the standard in use today. We have pioneered many and perhaps most of the ethical and fair play standards recognized in the field today. What we're talking about today is a very specific and difficult kind of case, consumer debt collection cases, where creditors are attempting to extract small dollar debt from frequently unrepresented consumers who are often in de desperate financial straits. Uh, in our discussions with the subcommittee and most recently publicly, uh, we indicated that we do not currently handle nor would we receive these cases uh, until, at least until some standards are established that are satisfactory. But I'd like to suggest a way forward. About 10 years ago, we established consumer due process protocols to ensure balance in what was then a very young, growing field of arbitration, consumer arbitrations in particular. 
Uh, these protocols, these rules of fair play were established, as with the earlier code of ethics for arbitrators, with individuals from a broad cross-section of society. We had consumer advocates, we had business advocates, we had regulators, uh, we had academics, wide variety of people giving input to what was uh, essentially consensus for some standards for fair play. The consumer due process protocols are today the standard of fair play in the uh, consumer dispute arena, as evidenced uh, by our small consumer caseload outside this debt collection area. Uh, we do about 1,100 of those a year. Almost three quarters of those cases are filed by consumers who are looking for redress. And they win about half of those and they settle many more of them ahead of time uh, before any decision. The due process protocols do common sense things. They do things like make sure the fees to the consumer are reasonable and that the process is accessible. Uh, they declare a right to both parties to have an impartial arbitrator. Uh, very significantly, they provide that all remedies that would be available in court must be available in the arbitration process. And interestingly, there, there is a, a feature of the uh, uh, due process protocols where the parties may elect to opt out of the arbitration process and go into small claims court. Uh, strikingly, um, uh, almost no one elects to do so. Why not? I think the reason is that the consumers in these debt collection cases, are, and the overwhelming majority of them, don't participate in the process. They are no-shows. It's inevitable that if you don't participate in your legal proceeding, there's a high likelihood you will lose. So this presents an interesting and very important challenge that has not yet been resolved by the courts or in arbitration. How do you construct a special set of due process protocols for these cases uh, so that the rights of the consumer are protected even if they fail to participate? And I think that's the challenge before us. We make some very specific recommendations in our written testimony uh, specific to these kinds of cases about notice issues, about arbitrator neutrality, about standards of proof for these cases, whether the parties attend or not. We propose to convene a broad-based, diverse working group to work towards balancing the process uh, in this very specialized area and building protection for the legal rights of parties. This kind of broad community inputting process works as evidenced by the existing due process protocols, and we would respectfully suggest that Congress should consider making such safeguards universal and mandatory by legislation so that all consumer debt collection arbitrations are properly conducted. Arbitration is a tool. It's simply a tool. It can be adapted to special circumstances to provide for access to fairness and justice for all parties in a dispute. We need to work toward that end, and I have to say it's very doable. We've conducted, for instance, no-fault insurance arbitrations for the Supreme Court and the people of Minnesota for three decades now. It's a, essentially a consumer arbitration process, and it works very well. And I think they present a model for properly conducted consumer arbitrations here. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes Mr. Bland for five minutes. You may proceed. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for the leadership you've shown in this area, both in this hearing and for several years. Um, Going into last week, I think that the entire consumer and civil rights bar of America was just absolutely shocked. Our eyebrows were singed by the unbelievable um, uh, revelations that came out of General Swanson's uh, case. The, that filing was amazing to us that it turned out that this National Arbitration Forum, which had been holding itself out as a neutral and deciding tens of thousands of cases in favor of debt collectors again and again, one after another, was actually largely owned or owned by 40 percent by the debt collectors themselves. But as Michael Kinsley, the, the, the pundit, always says, the real scandal is what's already legal. And the scandal here is that for 10 years before General Swanson released these facts, you've had this company operating essentially a rogue system that has been completely tilted in favor of the creditor. First of all, they have this incredible false humility whenever, there's, whenever someone challenges them in court, in which they say, well, we're just, the, we're just the court clerks. We don't really make any decisions. That's not true. They picked who the arbitrators are. Who the decision maker are means everything. If I could pick who the judges were in my cases, I would be the legal Michael Jordan sitting here. I'd never lose a case. Who the judges are makes a huge difference. So who did they pick? They do, they say, well, we have, we have 1,500 judges. Now, one thing is they got caught lying in a federal court in West Virginia where they named a bunch of people who were supposedly NAF arbitrators who were very prominent West Virginia lawyers who weren't. But they do have actually a big roster of a lot of important names. What they do, though, is that they sent cases out to the arbitrators, they figured out who was going to be ruling for the creditor nearly all the time, and they funneled 
more and more and more of the cases to this small number of people. So out of the 1,500 arbitrators, who decided the 34,000 cases that they publicly reported on in California? Over 90 percent of those cases were handled by two dozen arbitrators. You had one guy who was deciding something like 1,300 cases. You had people who were deciding 68 cases in a day, 40 cases in days again and again. I mean, that's not judging. That's rubber stamping. They were essentially blackballing anybody who ruled for the consumers, and they were funneling all the cases to people who they knew how they were going to rule. Okay? That is not the same as small claims court. The unbelievable insults in all the small claims court judges of America, you go in and you get who you get by a random selection. Nobody at a corporation sat down and picked which small claims court you got. That's a big difference. A second big difference is that there is no verification or substantiation or evidence required in the National Arbitration Forum before they give the creditor everything that they want. That's an invitation to abuse, and the invitation to abuse has been accepted, particularly by debt buyers. A lot of credit card companies sell the debts frequently for only a few cents on the dollar, sometimes as little as 0.1 one cent, um, cent on the dollar, to debt buyers, and the debt buyers keep getting further and further away. They usually have no evidence by then. They don't have a copy of the contract. They don't have statements. They don't have anything that actually links. They have a name, and they have an account number, and they have a dollar figure at the end, and that's it. No verification. And what they do is that they frequently then add all kinds of things on. Now, there's the idea here is, well, these people actually owe the debt, right? So since they owe the debt, they deserve to lose. Well, what we've seen again and again, literally in hundreds, if not thousands of cases that we've been able to document, again and again, somebody will owe $1,500 or $1,000 or $2,000, and then a bunch of junk fees are added, interest on interest, which is illegal, attorney's fees, which are not verified. Basically, the attorneys of the debt collector are rubber stamping something, and then they're getting $2,000 in attorney's fees, $1,000 in fees to the National Arbitration Forum, and what becomes a $1,500 debt suddenly becomes a $10,000, even a $15,000 or $20,000 debt. And what happens is, is that their rubber stamp arbitrators take those, and again and again and again, they just give them 100 cents on what they want. Now, a small claims court that useless and that lousy in America? By and large, it is not. In most courts in America, and there are problems in small claims courts in some places. The Boston Globe story was a great story. By the way, the Boston Globe reporter would be taking my position if he was here. And the idea that Elizabeth Warren would be a fan of the National Arbitration Forum, suppose a small claims court is, is someone who's never met or spoken to Elizabeth Warren. But what they do is they basically had a deal set up where they would, the, the, these um, debt collectors would send in an email because they're partly, they, have, they have this interconnection where they don't even have to actually file anything. There's no affidavit with it. The only statement is the email says that our client actually gave it to us. They're not even saying that it's actually true. They're just saying this is truly what our client gave us. And they send in an email with numbers in it. Then the NAF would take the email and they would turn it into the complaint. So the consumer, the thing the consumer gets isn't even what that was actually filed. All that was filed were some numbers that were taken from a printout. And then the complaint is sent with an order for 100 cents on the dollar. And that order is signed off again and again by the arbitrator. It's a joke. It's not the way small claims court goes. In small claims court, you get a default. That means you win. As you say, you win. But you don't get 100 cents on what you want. So you can't add on all these junk fees. You can't multiply debts in a crazy way. What's going to happen to all these phony awards? So they stop operating as of Friday. But meanwhile, there are hundreds of thousands of people out there, hundreds of thousands of people with phony awards that have been entered in against them. Are those all just going to stand? Or is that OK? And then in the race to the bottom, who's going to replace them? Is the chamber going to be OK with just sitting around and actually having you know, more, more neutral arbitrators? Or is, is the son of the NAF going to appear? Is Mr. Anderson going to run out and open up America's happiest consumer-friendly arbitration company in a week, and that will replace them? There's no reason why the banks can't do that. I, I thank the gentleman for his testimony. Your time has expired. Um, Chair recognizes Professor Drahausel. You may proceed, sir. For uh, five, thank you, Mr. Chairman and five um, Ranking Member Jordan, members of the subcommittee. Um, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity here to talk to you today about at least what colloquially is known as debt collection arbitration. Um, this world has changed dramatically in the last week, as we are all familiar with, and um, it's been sort of fascinating to, to be an observer of it. Um, I think uh, my, my, my experience in this area is as a scholar, it's not as a participant, and what we've been doing as part of the Searle Civil Justice um, Institute is looking at consumer arbitrations. We're, the first phase of our study has been to look at AAA consumer arbitrations, not mass claims being filed by creditors, but individual claims, most of which, as Mr. Namark said, were filed by um, 
the consumers, but a number of which were also fi filed by the creditors. Um, the follow-up phase of that study, I think, is where I can be at least somewhat helpful here to the committee, because it seems to me that one question that we need to think about at this point in the process, given what has happened with consumer arbitration, is where do those claims go now, or what happens um, in court if those claims end up being decided there instead. Um, and so what we've been doing in the next phase of our study is looking at consumer or business is bringing debt or creditors bringing debt collection cases in courts. We've looked at several samples of courts and um, have some, at least some preliminary findings to share with the committee. I mean, what that means is it's an ongoing process. Um, we've got more courts we want to look at and more cases we want to look at, but we at least do have some preliminary results. And, and sort of in, broadly speaking, those results are as follows. First of all, in the sample of cases we looked at, um, the creditors win the vast majority of these cases in court. Um, of the, all the judgments that we've examined in the courts in our sample, the creditors won 99.7 percent of the cases, basically all but one in each of the two courts the samples that, that we had looked at. Um, now, compared to that to our individual um, American Arbitration Association results, where we found that the business claimants won more like 83 percent of the cases, won some, some relief in those cases. Um, I, I, I certainly wouldn't suggest that that means that the AAA does, is better for the consumers. I think a big part of the explanation here is different types of claims. But it's important to have something to compare it to. You can't just look at numbers in one setting and conclude that that means a, a process is biased or unbiased. Um, of these judgments being entered in court, um, virtually all of them were entered by default. 96 to 98 percent of these cases in court were resolved by default judgments in favor of the creditor. I mean, basically, the consumers just didn't show up. Okay. To the extent we have issues or questions about how you give notice to consumers, what that suggests to me is service of process by a process server is not a magic answer. That even in the court setting, consumers don't show up. Um, and not surprisingly, when they don't show up, they lose. Now, if you compare that to the AAA cases we looked at, again, the individual cases brought by business claimants rather than the mass arbitrations, which we haven't had a chance to look at, um, under 40 percent of those cases were resolved without the sh consumer showing up. So again, this is not a matter of anything inherent in the arbitration process that consumers don't show up. That in fact, um, they can show up and in, so in some settings do show up if it's in their interest to do so. The third general conclusion that we've reached is, in these cases where the creditors are winning, um, with respect to Mr. Bland, the, the creditors win 100 cents on the dollar. That essentially they win the entire amount of principal that they seek and the entire amount of interest they are seeking in 97 to 99 percent of the cases. Right? There's just a handful of cases where the creditor recovers less than the amount that is being sought. Again, if you compare that to our AAA cases, there the creditors won 93 percent. Um, and again, I'm not suggesting this is necessarily that the consumer arbitration is a superior system. What's going on is these are types of claims where consumers don't show up to dispute them, and when they are resolved by whichever ever venue, they are resolved almost entirely in the creditor's favor. Um, one final point is in these consumer arbitration in consumer cases in court, uh, there were no trials. I mean, the vast majority of them were default judgments. There were a few summary judgment motions. None of these things went to jury trial. None of them went to a judge trial. Okay, this is not a matter of these consumers otherwise would be having all these claims adjudicated in court because these cases never make it that far. And again, it's not court versus arbitration. It's just the nature of the claim. Um, so what does that suggest to me? Well, I guess I have two general conclusions. The first is it, it makes me question whether, in fact, consumers are now going to be better off if they're going to court rather than in, in arbitration, um, because the results, I think, at least as far as the outcomes of the cases, look to me pretty much the same at, at best. And then second, if you think more broadly about the implications for arbitration and evaluating arbitration, what these numbers to me suggest is you cannot find bias in a forum simply because it tends to rule one way. You have to compare it to something. And you have to compare arbitration not to consumer claimants, but you have to compare business claimants and arbitration to business claimants in court. And the claims and results look an awful lot the same to me. Um, it suggests to me that it's not the venue that matters, it's the type of claim that matters. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we are now going to proceed with questioning from uh, members of our subcommittee. And I will start with uh, f my five minutes and then continue alternating between uh, uh, members of the uh, Democratic members of the panel and Republican members of the panel. I want to start with Mr. Kelly. Appreciate you being here. Now, in your testimony, 
you claim that arbitration is fair to consumers. But when you are marketing your services to banks, you tell your service people, and just want to put up a slide here. This is a slide of page two from a forthright creative paper entitled Non-Mandatory Paper Education. Uh, you tell your sales people to tell the banks that one of the benefits of arbitration is that it gives them control of the process. And in your marketing presentations to collection companies, like the next slide, please. Uh, this is the way you describe the effect of arbitration on the consumer. Quote, the consumer does not know what to expect from arbitration and is more willing to pay. Quote, they ask you to explain what arbitration is, then basically hand you the money. Quote, you have all the leverage and the customer really has little choice but to take care of this account. Now, Mr. Kelly, given the arbitrary and unfair results that our staff uncovered in its review of NAF claim files, and given the revelations by Attorney General Swanson in the complaint she filed against the NAF last week of the close financial relationship between the NAF and the debt collection industry, isn't it obvious that consumers have not been getting fair hearings in the NAF arbitrations? Chairman Kucinich, there were... Could you um, speak uh, directly into the mic so everyone can hear you? Thank you. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, there were several questions in there. I'll, I'll try to break them down. If, if I miss one, please. Uh, Start with uh, the fair hearings. Consumers getting fair hearings when uh, the marketing is slanted in that way? I will say that I'll note that the rest of that presentation does talk about due process protections and also discusses the fact that no outcomes are guaranteed and that, that the process is neutral and it does depend on the independence of the specific neutrals. With respect to marketing, we don't shy away from explaining that we do market our services and we market our services where the largest number of cases are. Frankly, in our civil justice system today, the majority of the cases are debt collection cases and we market those services. Uh, we did, excuse me, I, I need to keep making that clear. We, we obviously don't any longer uh, and won't. Um, but I will say that, you know, uh, at, at the National Arbitration Forum, they were unabashed believers that arbitration was a superior alternative to court. It is cheaper, it's efficient, it's faster. Now, in, in the case of collection of debt, it works the same. It would be cheaper, it would be effective, and it would well, be faster. Well, you know, but I, I had some specific questions here. Now, isn't it true that your marketing statements describe the real character of consumer debt collection arbitration? It's intimidating to consumer. It gives much more control and leverage to the creditor, and it leaves the consumer with little choice but to pay. I mean, that's what you've said. Isn't that the true character of consumer debt collection arbitration. Well, Isn't obviously, I can't deny the presence of this document. I believe it was back right. in 2003. I joined in 2006. I don't believe it's the most artfully drafted presentation by any means. Uh, but I will say it's the same. I mean, the, the process is difficult to work through, uh, whether it's court or whether it's arbitration. We go back to the point that is it any different between court or arbitration? Is there any fundamental difference? I believe that if there are fundamental differences, they're in favor of arbitration. Well, you claim that the NAF has rules to protect the consumer, but our investigation finds that NAF doesn't follow those rules. The NAF has a rule six that says that the notice of arbitration must be served promptly. The word promptly is not defined in your code of procedure, mm -hmm. but until August 1st, 2008, uh, NAF rule 41B3 said that any claim could be dismissed if more than 90 days passed between the filing of the claim and a proof of service to notice of, our, of the notice of arbitration. And that was, a, uh, uh, now the subcommittee staff looked at the forms that the NAF sends to the arbitrator with each batch of claims. They're called desk hearing lists. And each one contains a list of claims that the NAF was assigning in that batch and it recites for each claim the date on which the claim was filed and the date on which the notice of arbitration was served. These desk hearing lists that we reviewed showed that 
160 of 230, approximately 70 percent of the total, should have been dismissed by the NAF before they were even sent to the arbitrators because the notice was served more than 90 uh, was served more than 90 days, in some cases a lot more than 90 days after file, filing. But not one of those cases was dismissed. And, uh, you know, here is part of the desk hearing list sent to the arbitrator, Snyder, put up this uh, exhibit and then we'll I'll move on to the next questioner. It shows that NAF sent arbitrator Snyder claims that were served more than a year after they were filed. Clear violations of Rule 6. I mean, I mean this, you know, doesn't it show that you don't really follow your own rules? when those rules favor the consumer? I, I believe the discussion centers around Rule 41B. What Rule 41B states is a claim or response may be dismissed by an arbitrator or the forum at the request of a party in accord with Rule 18 or on the initiative of the arbitrator. May. May is the, is the, is the key word in this case. The arbitrator has the discretion to make that determination if it's in the interest of, of justice. That, that's not for the forum to make. It is for the arbitrator to make, and it is may, it is purely discretionary. Now, I'll have to check this, um, but my recollection is that this is a, a fairly new rule as well. So, so I would have to look at whether we're this gonna, rule was we're in gonna place. We're going to move on to Mr. Jordan, okay. and, I'll, and you know, he can have uh, six and a half minutes to match my time. I just want to say it may, be, it may be 90 days, it may be a year. It may. Uh, Mr. Kelly, what percentage of your um, business was the was debt collection arbitration? Uh, was the majority? I, I don't have a specific number, but yeah, clearly the majority. And uh, what what percentage of overall debt collection arbitration cases around the country did, did your uh, did your company handle? Majority? I, uh, I, I, I couldn't answer that question because I just don't know. Those statistics aren't publicly available. So I don't know what the universe is out there of arbitration. We're, we're a major player, if that's your point. Are you the, were you the largest we're. player? Uh, were you the largest player in this? I believe, I would, I would believe we would be. And you were, and as of last week, you're no longer in the business. That's correct. And we've heard testimony here about the, you know, the, the court system, the difficulties there. I mean, how, maybe this should go to Mr. Namark or, or maybe to our Attorney General. Um, how was, um, now that you're out of the business, you were the bigger, biggest player, um, it, are we going to be okay? I mean, Mr. Namark, you want to comment? Can we, can we handle what's, what's, what's going to happen now? Well, we have announced that we will not uh, receive these cases, at least at the present time, until there's some uh, establishment of some... Speak closer to that microphone, please. Some establishment of additional uh, standards of fair play, uh, like the due process protocols that we described. So the, the, whole, the whole motivation of this hearing is to look out for consumers out there. So what's going to happen in this, this flux we're in or this interim period? Uh, would, would the Attorney General like to comment? Sure, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member uh, Jordan. I, I think that's why it's important for Congress to act. Uh, you know, the National Arbitration Forum was a, as I understand it, the dominant player in the consumer collection mm -hmm. industry. Um, there could be other companies, other arbitration companies right now that would take over these claims and could arbitrate them, or a whole new company could pop up tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think these hearing is uh, so important and commend all of you for your leadership in holding it and why I think it's important that Congress act to rein in these practices. Uh, National Arbitration Forum was one company, but the underlying problems with mandatory pre-dispute arbitrations um, run across uh, the industry and are systemic. Attorney General, would you agree yeah. with uh, what the professor had to say? I believe his comment was it's not the venue, it's the type of claim that's the determining factor here. Do you, do you think that's an accurate statement? R Ranking Member uh, Jordan, no, I don't. I think the venue is uh, problematic with arbitration uh, because you're essentially allowing the corporations who are litigants to handpick the judge. You're letting the corporation select which arbitration company you want to adjudicate the claim. And based on the interviews we've conducted of consumers, of arbitrators, of employees, there is tremendous press pressure on the arbitration companies. It's a very, very lucrative and profitable business. And the corporations know that if the arbitration company isn't perceived to be friendly enough to corporate litigants, they can simply move their business to a new company for all the reasons I described. Thank so I think, think the venue is problematic. Thank you. Mr. Namark, what, what, what's your response to what the professor, I thought he laid out some good numbers. And, and his statement about the venue versus the type of claim. 
Well, I, I think we see from the research and people's experience that there are similar problems in, in uh, both court and in arbitration. The, the, the real issue is non-participation by the individual right. uh, debtor. Uh, it's, I think it's a real problem. I think somehow or other we need to build in some safeguards. We need to try to get their attention. We need to do better at communicating with them. And I think our, our civil justice system at large could stand some improvements in terms of due process protections. We could all use it. Uh, Professor, I've been quoting you and haven't given you a chance to talk, so maybe you can elaborate on some of the numbers. I think you talked about uh, the percentages uh, found in favor of the consumer um, were actually this, uh, roughly the same, if I remember your numbers. I didn't look at them here closely, uh, in small claims court versus in, in arbitration. So if you can maybe elaborate on that. I have about a minute left. Yeah, I mean, the, the courts we looked at were two. Actually, neither of them was a small claims court. One was claims that the federal government brings in federal court, <clears throat> court against people who alleged to still owe amounts on their student loans. And in those cases, the ones that make it to judgment, the government wins 99.7 percent of the time. Um, we also looked at a sample of cases from Oklahoma, which has a fabulous online access to their court files for at least a number of the counties um, that we can actually use for research. I mean, our choice of, uh, of what we studied, frankly, was totally due to access to the data and no other, no other factors went into it other than make, trying to find similar cases. Um, and the courts that we looked at in Oklahoma were actually not the small claims court, but the sort of next up court, which, looks at claim, which, which adjudicates claims mm -hmm. of under $10,000. Um, and one difference in Oklahoma is those claims actually, um, the majority of those claims were brought by debt buyers. So it allows us to look at the results in those cases. And again, of the cases that made it to judgment, 99.7 percent um, were resolved um, in favor of the business, uh, of the creditor in that case. Um, and I, again, I can't sort of say arbitration is better or worse. I mean, the arbitration cases we looked at were AAA cases, not mass arbitrations, but um, ones adjudicated in their sort of trip, the typical individual uh, manner. And in those cases, the business won something in about 83 percent of the cases. And again, I don't tout that to say arbitration is better because consumers win more. What I would say is it seems to me the reason for those differences is likely differences in the types of claims that, that are being brought. Um, and I guess one follow-up point is in going through the AAA's files and doing this research, I mean, we would see correspondence with with both sides, businesses, and with consumers who are unhappy. I mean, not surprisingly, when people lose, they're unhappy with, with, with the party. And, and we saw no suggestion whatsoever of kowtowing to business interests um, or to consumer interests. I mean, the response was the same. We, we, we administer these cases. The arbitrators make the decisions. And if you don't like it, you can go somewhere else if you want. But, but we're going to do, we're, we're not going to sort of skew the process in one way, one, one, one party's favor or the other. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Cummings is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here. And I just listened here. And um, I got to tell you, this is a mess. And um, a lot of the people who are getting ripped off are my constituents. Uh, I live in the inner, 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 inner city of Baltimore. And um, I've listened to this testimony. And I want to uh, thank you, Ms. Swanson, for uh, what you're doing and, and others of you who are trying to get to the bottom of this. You know, as I was listening, I, I've been in those courts. I practice law. I'm a trial lawyer. And, you know, um, it's one thing to, for somebody not to show up. And we can do some things probably in our uh, district court systems, our lower court systems, to let people know about the significance of getting certified mail and what it means and they need to show up. It's another thing to go into a forum thinking that you're going to be treated fair and you're getting screwed. That, there's a, that's a whole other kind of situation and I think we need to, to, to think about that. And, and, you know, Mr. Kelly, I just want to ask you, um, you know, the subcommittee staff looked at 230 claims filed by uh, NAF by uh, with the NAF by Worldwide Asset Purchasing, uh, and in we got a chart here. In 40 cases, the NAF arbitrator Jennings dismissed the claims because Worldwide did not provide the dates of the last payment or any other information on which Jennings could determine whether the claims were filed 
within the California statute of limitations. In 18 claims, the NAF arbitrator Crottinger dismissed the claims because Worldwide did not provide him with any specific information about how the notice of arbitration was served. However, in 172 identical claims, claims that didn't have any more statute of limitations evidence or any more evidence of service in the Jennings and Crottinger claims had, three other arbitrators apparently ignored those deficiencies and issued awards to Worldwide in exactly the amounts requested by Worldwide. Doesn't it show that the results in your debt collection arbitrations depend more on who the arbitrator is than what the facts or, or the law are? I want to direct that to Mr. Bland. I, I think that's exactly right. I think that who the arbitrator is is incredibly decisive, and that's why that's why focusing all of the um, uh, all of the cases on a handful of people matter. The idea that the data is the same between court and arbitration in front of the NAF is simply not true in several ways. First of all, uh, Congresswoman Watson, when she was here, put the Business Week article in the record. The Business Week discovered that debt buyers are willing to pay like twice as much money for old debts, particularly debts that are outside of the statute of limitations, if there was a National Arbitration Forum clause on it. The debt buyer industry, they think it's worth a lot more money to have an old debt, or a debt that's, that's, that's not good, in front of the NAF than they did in small claims court. The idea that, that, that can, you compare um, these types of really old debts in, in credit card context with student loans is totally off the wall, to be honest, because student loans have no statute of limitations. You can be pursued on a student loan that you took out 70 years ago. The Supreme Court, Congress, because Congress wants student loans to be, um, to be collected, has a totally different set of rules than, um, than debt collections. Also, I mean, the advertisements of the organization, they particularly wrote advertisements aimed at debt collectors that would say, we will give you, we will improve your bottom line was one advertisement, or 66% better results was another Mr. advertisement we've seen. Mr. Bland, thank you. Now I want to hear from Mr. Kelly, if you don't mind. And what was the specific question, Mr. Cummins? You don't want me to repeat that long question. Well, do you want me to talk about this, or do you want me to address Mr. Bland's comments? I want you to, yes, you can, you can go ahead and address this statement and okay. the question. First of all, once the cases are given to the arbitrators, the arbitrators are the finding of fact. Now, I'm not a trial lawyer, but as a corporate finance lawyer, I can tell you I've gone with clients to court in certain venues in certain jurisdictions and been crushed by judges on the same point of law that in other jurisdictions in front of other justices we've prevailed on. Can you He's arbitrator a shop? Will Can you arbitrator yield? shop? Yeah, yeah. Will the gentleman yield? Yes, of course. Is, is, is that why you go ahead and try to get the uh, arbitrators who are going to give you a better decision? Which is where I was going, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, would you like me to talk about how the arbitrators are actually assigned? Yeah, and I ask you, Ken, is, is it possible to arbitrator shop? In other words, just like you shop for a judge? There, there is a strike rule in the National Arbitration Forum rules, similar to the strike rule in many courts. The state of Minnesota, which is where the forum was founded, has a strike rule, where each party, for any reason, can strike the arbitrator once. Now, the rules also provide that the parties can agree on an arbitrator uh, as well. So that, that's the process that's employed. Ch Gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. Uh, chair recognizes uh, Mr. Shack. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for uh, your testimony here today. Um, I guess I'm interested specifically in um, where we go from here. Um, obviously, um, there seems to be um, some some issues um, at, that were brought forward by Attorney General Swanson. I'm sure some of these problems were not uh, just specific to Minnesota. Um, I live in Illinois. Uh, I'm sure the other 48 states have similar problems. That being said, uh, I, I'm not sure that I'm ready to uh, throw away the arbitration process. Um, I'm not convinced that um, all consumers would be better off uh, going to the court of law, having to hire an attorney, having to incur those costs uh, for what would otherwise be a, a small claims court uh, item. So I guess if you could enlighten us through your work, uh, Attorney General Swanson, on where you think the Congress ought to be looking to improve the arbitration process unless, in fact, you believe we should do away with the process altogether. 
Sure. Thank you, Congressman. Um, you know, the problems, the biggest problem I see uh, from all of the interviews and discussions we've had is, again, this ability of the corporation who writes the clause into the contract to handpick the arbitration company who's going to adjudicate the claims. It's not how it works in court. In court, you know, you file a lawsuit, you get the judge, and that's the judge of the case. And that judge is not dependent upon that corporation for the salary. The salary comes from the taxpayers. I can speak to Minnesota. In Minnesota, we've got good small claims court. If you go into small claims court in Minnesota, the judges, even if the consumer doesn't show up in a default hearing, they tend to scrutinize those cases. You know, does the consumer appear to owe the money? Did they actually incur the debt? Um, is it, are, are the T's crossed and the I's dotted such that before that judge issues a default judgment, that um, that it looks like there's sufficient evidence to enter that judgment? I, I think the problem is that, for example, when you look at these consumer due process protocols that have been discussed, NAF largely followed them too, or had them, supposedly, but yet it didn't stop a whole lot of consumers in Illinois, we've talked to Illinois people in Ohio and around the whole country, from getting hurt. And so I think what Congress ought to do is say that in these kinds of situations where uh, the consumer has no leverage, where the company is giving them contracts on a take it or leave it basis, the consumer is not seeing the clause, that they ought not to be allowed uh, in the area of you know, the credit card disputes, consumer disputes, cell phone contracts, that mandatory pre-dispute arbitration clauses uh, shouldn't be allowed. So what should happen if I'm a consumer and I refuse to pay my $100 bill uh, which now becomes $150 or what have you, you can fast forward down the line. What what should happen? Well, a couple things could happen. Um, it, one could be, after the fact, the consumer could agree to arbitration. If pre-dispute arbitration clauses weren't allowed and the collection agency is pursuing the consumer to pay that bill, and if they actually owe the bill, they could agree after the fact to arbitrate in a mutually um, a forum that's mutually in both parties' best interest. Um, the creditor could file a claim in small claims court, uh, which in, at least in Minnesota, is uh, straightforward, moves quickly. Uh, people do have a right of appeal to a district court there. Uh, those are a couple ways. And then certainly the creditor has all of their other collection op opportunities available, reporting to credit bureaus, et cetera. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, um, I, I find it interesting that even the federal government uses uh, an arbitration process when we choose to collect our, our debts, specifically student loans, uh, in which arbitrators rule on behalf of the federal government nearly 99% of the time. Um, so uh, I, I guess, Mr. Neymark, uh, if you could speak to the claims that the arbitration uh, organizations are unduly uh, uh, biased towards business, uh, would you like to respond to that? Sure. Let me uh, approach it this way. I, I think the key issue here is, is the arbitrator who's the decision maker in the case. And you can do a number of things, which we do, uh, to enhance the, the uh, trust in the neutrality of the arbitrator. First of all, a, a, a thorough review of the people who are put on the panel or the list of potential arbitrators so that you're sure that you have people of, of the right kinds of background and history. Uh, we follow a very strict disclosure process where any uh, contact the uh, or uh, uh, issue that might be disclosable it has to be disclosed to the parties, giving them an opportunity to object. Um, thorough, thorough training for the arbitrators, and I would suggest in the debt collection area uh, that training needs to be beefed up to deal with some of the specific issues we're talking about today in terms of due process protection and the kinds of uh, interest decisions and others, uh, so that you're sure that the arbitrators are, are uh, familiar with those things. We did one other thing for the short time we administered some of these cases, and we had an internal operating process where we said if the um, cons consumer showed up and made an objection to an arbitrator, it was an automatic removal, and if the business objected, we would not remove them, and that way you don't get to stack the entire pool of arbitrators. Say that again, if a consumer objected to the arbitrator, in other Gentlemen, words, the consumer... The gentleman's time's expired, but okay. why don't you answer what he said. Yeah, if the consumer objected, we'd remove the arbitrator. If the business objected, we would not. So and how, and I don't mean to ex extend yeah, your lease, but how, how would they object? They just say, I think this arbitrator is biased. They have to fill out a form. It, What's involved uh, with that? Gentlemen, gentlemen's time's expired. Uh, you may be new to this committee, but I try to allow everybody plenty of time here. And we're going to go to uh, Mr. Foster. We'll come back for another okay, round. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
I um, serve on the Financial Services Committee, and we're in the process of, of marking up legislation on the, the Obama um, proposal. And I guess the relevant part for this discussion here is the proposal for a Consumer Financial Protection Agency. And I was wondering um, if any of you could comment on do more. If any of you could comment on, um, first off, whether the proposed grant of authority um, in, under this um, proposal would be sufficient to deal with this problem, frankly, and um, secondly, whether the suggestion of a, of a federal preemption as opposed to a federal floor with the states allowed to, um, to raise the bar for a higher level of protection um, would be more appropriate for this level of situation. Anyone who wants to? Pick that up. Yes, Attorney General. Well, certainly representing the state of Minnesota, and I think uh, my colleagues in other states would agree that we would be, uh, certainly I would be strongly opposed to any type of federal preemption of states' ability to do better to protect their citizens, their consumers. I think our country right now is facing an economic meltdown uh, that had we had more cops on the beat, perhaps we would have been better served. And so I think um, if Congress, or if the federal government can pass a floor to protect consumers, I think that's a good thing. I think it's healthy to have multiple regulators on a beat uh, because hopefully if one's not acting, the other will. But in terms of preempting states' ability to act, I think that would be misguided. Um, and as you know, we're seeing a trend away from that with the recent Supreme Court ruling of the U.S. Supreme Court allowing states to uh, move more toward being able to enforce laws. I, th I think that's a good thing. Now, is the grant of authority, are, are you familiar enough with it to, to have see holes in the grant of authority? Um, or would that have been sufficient to at least um, have the CFPA um, in principle act on this thing? On you know, federal Congressman, level? I'm not familiar enough with the actual language. Yeah, Mr. Bland? Congressman, I think that with respect to financial services, the that the um, grant of authority that's in the, in the um, statute, in the proposed statute or proposed legislation would be enough to solve the problems of abuse of mandatory arbitration. I think it would let the, um, it would let the federal government come in and ban these clauses where they're being abused by payday lenders and subprime lenders and, and a variety of other ways. Um, and I, th I think the language, language is broad enough. Where it doesn't address is um, issues such as um, civil rights. I mean, there's a lot of employment cases that are being sent to arbitration where you end up with an arbitrator who's, you know, defends um, uh, uh, companies against civil rights claims being the judge. And there's a lot of other areas like that it doesn't address. But for financial services, the language, I think, is very broad and, and would deal with the problem uh, uh, very well. And with respect to the preemption issue, I think one of the things you'd see if you read some, through some of the briefing in the, in the most recent Cuomo versus Clearinghouse case was that state regulations regulators bring tons of cases against um, banks for deceptive practices, for, um, di for disc racial discrimination and lending and so forth. And the federal agencies, the OCC, the Office of Comptroller of Currency and uh, the OTS, have done almost nothing. And what happened in the last eight years was you had the last administration dramatically change and rewrite the regulations so as to basically give banks a sort of a get out of jail free card and wipe away state laws that state regulators used to enforce really vigorously. So having yeah. the states have, a, have it be a floor rather than a ceiling would be a dramatic and, and really valuable change. Yeah. Do any the other of you have comments about what's good, bad, and ugly about these proposals? No. Okay. Well, I yield back in that case. I thank I thank the gentleman. Uh, chair recognizes uh, gentleman from Georgia. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for uh, holding this very timely hearing, and uh, and allowing me to uh, be a part of it. I do appreciate it, and uh, I will say that uh, H.R. 1020, which is uh, a bill to ban pre-dispute mandatory arbitration clauses uh, in consumer agreements, in uh, employment agreements, and in uh, franchise or franchisee agreements, uh, would be the ultimate fix of this uh, problem. And the problem is that we're, we're trying to outsource or privatize uh, these kinds of uh, resolutions, if you will, by sidestepping the, um, the uh, civil process, you know, the courthouse, in other words. And when you you know, I, I got this vision in my mind of the courthouse on the square, and there's a 
like a, uh, you can go around the courthouse in a circle and then there's all these uh, restaurants with great breakfasts and uh, great lunches. And uh, you can be there all day. And I'm thinking about a, a, a hot summer day with the fan just uh, kind of twirling around lazily. It's a lazy afternoon and um, nothing else to do. I've hung out uh, on the porch since early morning, did a little fishing. Uh, after that, uh, played some checkers thereafter, got something to eat at lunchtime. And, and now I heard about this great lawyer that's trying this case over here in the courthouse. I'll go over there. Uh, and you spend your afternoons uh, uh, watching uh, the lawyers. And, um, and at that same courthouse, you can, if you want to know whether or not your, your uh, neighbor has beaten his wife, how many times that he has beat his wife, you can go to the courthouse and find that. If you uh, need to look at the adoption papers, you just adopted a child, uh, you can find that at the courthouse. Your real estate deeds, your liens, uh, how many people have sued you? How many convictions do you have? All of that information is at the courthouse. And at the courthouse, uh, you can't lie. You cannot lie because you get charged with perjury or obstruction. And um, it's okay to, to, to uh, lie to your neighbor across the fence, telling them about that uh, big fish that you caught or that hole in one that you, uh, that you hit. You know, you can lie about things like that, but you can't lie in the courthouse. Now, arbitration is uh, different. There is no place for a trial, a public trial, where people can come and enjoy the proceedings. Uh, there are no public records to be viewed. Uh, in fact, most, most folks don't even, the public doesn't even uh, know when there's an arbitration proceeding taking place. And, and then when the uh, arbitrator rules and uh, he, even, he or she even uh, uh, goes against the National Arbitration Forum rules, which are, uh, are uh, advisory <laughs> in my opinion only, not, not uh, uh, binding in any way, uh, then you, you, you have no meaningful right to uh, appeal the decision. And so the only thing that I can see that we need to do is what I've done with uh, my Arbitration Fairness Act of 2007, excuse me, 2008, and again in the 111th Congress, the uh, uh, H.R. 1020. And I'm proud to announce that uh, there are uh, uh, a number of members of this committee, uh, including the chairman, who have uh, signed on as, as uh, co-sponsors. I know Mr. Uh, Cummings, is, Cummings is on that bill also. And, uh, and that's the best way to, uh, to solve this problem is that the Sixth Amendment right to a civil trial in any uh, endeavor, or any dispute in excess of $20 uh, needs to be adhered to the, the gentleman's and I'll, the gentleman's uh, time the has expired time. Uh, <clears throat> although I will say the gentleman and all the other members are welcome to return in one hour uh, we're going to recess for one hour for six votes on the floor of the house uh, after that one hour I would ask that all members of the panel return uh, assuming that you're able to do that and we will then go to one more round of questioning and uh, it'll be brisk, and then uh, we'll conclude the business of this committee. I want to thank you for your presence here. And uh, this committee stands in recess for one hour.